Yeah, so how was the tour so far? Yeah, we've there's uh, five shows left, 27 shows in total. So this is show number 22, I think. And since the start, it's it's been fantastic. Very, very, very well attended. And uh, the the bands, each band on the tour, I think, brings their own, like, style and presence and makes the package interesting. And uh, it's a dream for us, too. I mean, we've been fans of Napalm Death since, you know, since the beginning. So big influences on us in a lot of ways. So just being out with them is is yeah. a really big deal for us. Actually, I, I always thought that, or, well, for the past couple of years, I thought you you would have a, like a personal connection to Napalm Death somehow because you also wrote a book or published a book. Maybe we'd touch on that uh, for, for a minute yeah. uh, because it's called it's called uh, Extremity Retained, mm -hmm. which is a Napalm Death track, right? That's correct. I just thought it had a good ring to it. And, you know, the the book's topic kind of, it's it's basically an oral history of death metal called Extremity Retained, and and it, I felt I just felt like it represented that you know the book as a whole, this idea of how death metal music was this such an extreme thing when it began, and you know has it retained that extremity throughout the 30 years or so it's been around, and and it tells that through a lot of different stories and with those who created it and play it and record it and work with it and stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I don't own a copy of it. Maybe I should own a copy of it sooner or later. Um, yeah, as, as you ju just mentioned, um, there are a lot of personal accounts, I think, in the book, as far as I know. If you look back at uh, death metal history, compare death metal today to its to its early days when everybody was still young and angry, <laughs> have, have things changed a lot? Well, I think the culture is kind of caught up with death metal in a way. You know, f in 1988, 89, 1990, you could play death metal to the average person, and it would probably, it shocked them. They, like, they didn't understand it. You know, it was just too much for them to take in sonically. So, <clears throat> in a way, the culture has moved ahead. Like, overall culture has become more extreme. So, when you play death metal, people, most people kind of know or have heard of death. They might, not, they might not have heard death metal music. But they heard the name, and they know that there's this genre out there called death metal, and it's this really extreme stuff. and And a lot of it doesn't shock anymore in the sense that it used to. Um, you know, even like a lot of the lyrical stuff, which used to be, you know, pretty extreme, like the early Cannibal Corpse stuff. You know, in this day and age, where the internet has kind of made everything anyone can imagine, the horrors of the world available to watch or see at the touch of a button, you know, the lyrics of Cannibal Corpse and, you know, don't seem uh, as extreme, I guess, in that context. So. Does that, no, you just mentioned c culture in itself got more extreme. So is, is this what you mean with uh, referring, uh, you know, to the horrors that you can access through the internet or is there more to it in terms of, you know, human interaction maybe or societies? Um, I guess the, the, there, I think that things have just sped up. Like things, we live in a kind of more of accelerated culture now, and with that, um, a lot of these kind of extreme things are just uh, there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Does that affect your approach uh, to music, uh, composing music for Misery Index in any way? Um. Well, we kind of just stick to what we know, and I guess our philosophy is more like the riffs are what matters, like riffs, songwriting. So, the, you know, every form of extreme music is kind of out there now. You've had the most extreme, you know, grindcore, extreme death metal, which is so brutal and over the top that, you know, it's it's really hard to, I don't know, at least for me, to, to get really sh blown away by the heaviness of it. It's just kind of... So what it comes down to is the substance and the riffs themselves and songwriting, just writing, trying to write good songs and, 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 and you know, and push the boundaries a little bit so things aren't just like stagnating. And for us, we're not trying to be the most extreme band in the world. We just uh, focus on the songs and the riffs and, and that's priority. Yeah. So um, w what I hear in this is also a little bit, um, yeah, The, the notion that everything has been done already, maybe, in death metal. So, you know, 
are there no boundaries left and d d does it become boring to you at some point then no because i think there's a good song is timeless and while i you know i i appreciate a lot of the really extreme stuff it doesn't it doesn't uh it doesn't stick with me i guess so i mean i feel like we're to the average person misery next is probably still a pretty extreme band but uh when compared with the other stuff that's out there with the and how brutal death metal's gotten i don't think it's like stagnating and everything everything might not you know i wouldn't have said i guess everything's been done in the sense that the the template is there and there's variations on that template in death which you know which go in different directions but more or less things as far as like trying to push the boundaries of how fast the human body can blast beat or how low the human throat can you know uh how deep they can make the music and gurgle and come up with these different sounds like that you know at some point it gets beyond like, like uh where our interests lie as i as i keep reiterating is, is in the, so the structure of the song and songwriting and and that sort of thing yeah that's the, what keeps it grounded i think for us yeah. so uh, one one aspect that i really appreciate about misery index are uh, the lyrics um so when you sit down and compose a song and write the lyrics, which of the two takes more time to you? Um, well, for us, we write all the music first, pretty much. The song musically is is the, the basic foundation is, is written first, and then, and then we take that and we adjust that to the lyrics. You know, okay, well, this is a song, but I think that would be better if it had two verses here kind of thing, and then so we just have it go another time and add another verse, and... And that's when I kind of get it, or in some cases, Mark. Mark writes some lyrics too. We, you know, we, we I, I sit down and listen to it, feel it through, and just start thinking of patterns, you know, and rhymes. And I'm kind of a traditionalist in that sense that I, I really like my words to rhyme and and have a, a lot of like uh, <clears throat> um, imagery in them. And you know, I like a lot of the classic English. You know, poets and and things like that, and, and writers, and and so once I get the the song itself, then the, then we start working with the lyrics, and you know, it takes for me. That's I guess my the, my biggest task because I write most of them, and <clears throat> I, I write. I usually get like one or two songs on an album these days, so I do write some of the music, but yeah. I think the majority of it's done by Mark now. And uh, the the lyrical content, well, I mean, there's, there's a lot, lot of substance to it. I I, w I would think personally. Um, I mean, can can you imagine writing, let's say, yeah, m more like like simplistic brain dead gore lyrics as well? Or is this? I mean, you know, th th there must be something going on in you. You know, I want to write or about this and that. You you must at some point decide on a topic. So how how does this process work? Well, since we. Since the beginning, we've had, we had lyrics which are, you know, kind of based on everyday reality and everyday life and the human condition in life and, and all of its expressions, ideology, politics, you know, human struggle, class relations, like all those kind of things that kind of bubble up in the lyrics as a theme. But a lot of times we like to make them, I don't know, something you can grab onto and and tell a story maybe or you know write them so that other people might be able to connect or relate to them so um yeah those we've we just looked at everyday life and and every day you know if you look at the news or other things and just think about the world and where we're going there's there's plenty of things there to yeah to scream about so for the current album, I think the first single that you uh, that you released um, was uh, New Salem, yeah. um, which to me, like lyrically, yeah, my interpretation would be that it's more like a criticism against excessive political correctness, maybe. Um, maybe you can add a little bit to that and give me your point of view. Yeah, that's part of it, but more it's more a critique of the kind of binary nature of how our current media systems work so they're pushing more of this more rapid fire kind of like ideologically driven kind of uh <clears throat> you know twitter culture kind of thing which 
which doesn't really benefit either side. So <clears throat> in that binary that you're creating, things are a lot more complex than that and a lot more, um, and that complexity needs to be expressed through, you know, more well thought out debate and which our media systems don't really sustain. And it doesn't look really good right now. Yeah. It probably doesn't make good headlines either, right? Like a balanced statement or balanced thoughts. No, it, you know, that's the thing. If you, you know, politics is, is drudgery, you know, it's like, it's working things out, working through complex com problems and ideas. And it's not meant to be a game or a shouting match or, you know, a, uh, I gotcha on this, you got me on that kind of thing. It's, it just does, it, it tears away the social fabric of this and weakens the fact that we're, we're all in this together in the end. And it just kind of fuels that sort of like, uh, you know, the fragment, the further fragmentation of culture and politics and life. And, and <clears throat> yeah, and, and that really is the whole theme of the album, Rituals of Power, is about the concept of truth in this kind of new media environment, how it becomes a flexible thing. People have their own versions of reality based on the news they read and, and the way that creates sort of all these divisions and things like that. So it's, more or less a loose theme for the whole record. Every song kind of like has a different kind of spin on that, whether it's historical or about something specific or like the choir invisible, which is, which is about, which is inspired by the refugee crisis in 2016. And, you know, it's from the point of view of someone who's trying to escape to get a better life and is willing to risk, risk death, you know, in the seas just to try and, find something you know some way of existing <laughs> so and about how the media framed that whole thing too in Europe and the US and so you know there's different things like that <laughs> so do you follow the uh, European news as well yeah um, I, I was wondering actually when you mentioned the refugee crisis how big of an issue that would be in the US news probably it's not a big big headline there is it it was at the time um, you know of course the The U.S. has its own uh, refugee issues with, with uh, Latin Americans yeah. coming to the southern border and trying to get it, get it over and make a better life. And that's totally politicized. And, and, the, and the sort of human compassion aspect of it all is just sidelined, you know. And, but I actually live in Finland these days. Um, and I have lived there for like three years now. So I, I do have a European kind of focus on things now. So, yeah. I think you lived in Germany for a while as well. You, you speak some German as well, right? Yeah, ein bisschen. Yeah. Wir können ja auch auf Deutsch weitermachen dann, oder? Uh, wenn, du, wenn du willst, wir können <laughs> auf Deutsch reden, aber es ist, vielleicht ist es besser auf Englisch. Okay, so let's, let's go back to English. So um, um, I, I just would, would like to touch on this one point that you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, uh, the media is kind of like binary, either you know, pushing the, in the left direction or the right direction and... By this, maybe people come apart as well. Um, so I, I've been to the States a couple of times, and I, I see this reflected also in the political systems uh, system in a way. Yeah, so it's either Democrats or Republicans. And uh, what I found strange was that um, you know when when I travel around, that it, at least in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. You have to correct me then. That those two groups in in everyday life rarely mix in a way right it's kind of like as if it's geographically separated in a way is, is that a wrong impression that i have that you were you know you have certain states that are totally democratic and the other others are very much republican and in these kind of like extreme states these two groups ne like you know people with different opinions don't don't really or different political standpoints don't really meet that much and to discuss Yeah, there's that geographic component for sure. There's, you know, across the states, there tends to be a general split along the coast, like the co the west coast and the east coast tend to tend to be more liberal and uh, you know progressive and politically, and in the south and in the Midwest, there tends to be more um, right leaning conservative kind of worldviews and. 
and it's expressed in their politics. And yeah, I mean, in a lot of cases, they don't, you know, get to sit down with each other because there, there are, you know, a lot of the so-called liberal media is based in, <clears throat> is I say so-called because I don't think the the, the U.S. media is <laughs> liberal as as a lot of the right com, uh, um, complains about, but. A lot of the more progressive liberal voting people tend to be in in locations like New York City, you know, San Francisco, Washington D.C., and these, and, you know, they're they're more urban, more cosmopolitan, have a more progressive worldview, and those and you know who in a lot of cases are kind of left behind, and that's why my, they might seek out the the more to attach themselves with this more populist ideology that got Trump voted in. Because a lot of the people out in the in the countryside who you know f- who maybe used to work in, in the manufacturing industry or have lost their jobs or something, you know they don't they don't really <clears throat> see how the interests of those city dwelling uh, progressive types really coincide with theirs. So, and they're not really you know visiting or talking to each other in a lot of cases unless unless somebody is seeking to get elected, I guess. But. But yeah, there is that component. It's unfortunate. And going back to the main theme, I think our media systems like fuel that sort of separation too, because they each read their own news and build their own worldviews based on that. And yeah. You know. So I mean, uh, world w- worldviews uh, obviously also change with um, you know being exposed to to new things, traveling around. You've been traveling quite a bit, uh, touring a bit with with the band. Do you still remember? The first time that you left the states for a tour, and, how, and uh, like, w- what what kind of impression did that leave on you? Um, yeah, well, the first, well, the first time we left the states, I guess, was in the early '90s when I was in Dying Fetus, and we would go up to play in Canada. We would sometimes just pack up a car and and drive, you know, 500 miles to Montreal from from Baltimore, Washington D.C. area just to play one show for like, you know, pretty much no money. <laughs> just because we thought it was, it would be amazing just to go play a show at another city. And and at that time, metal, extreme metal, was much more welcome and popular in Quebec with bands like Cryptopsy, especially, were, were kind of leading the charge of this new generation. Anyways, <clears throat> that was, a, that would always be a lot of fun. As far as a tour, we didn't actually tour outside the U.S. until 1998 when Dying Fetus came to uh, tour Europe. And that was like a 30, 35-show tour we did around Europe with Span Deranged from Sweden. And that was a blast. We didn't make any money on that tour either, and <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. And it was really cool just to meet you know, meet face to face a lot of the people I was like writing letters with and pen pals and trading tape trading with and you know the first time is always like the most memorable and that, and that for sure was for us. Yeah. Had a lot of shows in Germany too. It was you know, a lot of really cool ones. I, I guess it's kind of like the dream of every let's say young band, even today, to go out on tour and you know, have fun, party, and you know see the world. Uh, but obviously. No, touring can also be a struggle, I believe. Um, so may- maybe you can give me a few anecdotes from from your life on on tour. You know, what were the highlights and what were the worst <coughs> worst things that you can remember? Well, I mean, that tour in '98, <laughs> you know, we it was a lot of fun, but we were uh, in, and found ourselves in quite miserable conditions for most of it. You know, we're driving around in a camper, I think, and we're all piled in there with everything and just really long drives you know no food like no sleep like it was you know it's like you hear these stories all the time about these kind of tours where you're just like you know living in the van or whatever and starving but i mean after that it kind of got better but um i mean i don't really have any i guess i I need to ask you something more specific (laughs) if you're going on tour these days what's the most important thing for you actually so that you can play a good show or that you feel good on tour? What do you appreciate? Well, everything comes down to the, you know, 45 minutes on stage, you know, all the 23 hours of the day build up to that. And, 
you know, we try to stay healthy. You know, we've been doing this for quite a while now, so it's like the party kind of side of it or just the sheer, you know, elation of being out on the road as, as a, for the first few times. That kind of has passed now, you know, like, so we try to be more professional in the sense that, you know, we want to put on a good show so we stay healthy and, you know, we might have a, a, a drink every now and then. And, and it's, you know, it's all, it's just all about the music at this point. We just want to play a good show and, and we want to make sure we're uh, in good, in the best shape we can for that. So uh, this was this one bit of trivia that I'd like to know. I, I think I read somewhere that you had registered for PhD studies somewhere. It's correct. Yeah. Did you finish that? And I'm um, almost done. Yeah. So, so where, where are you registered and uh, what is the PhD about? Um, registered or affiliated with the University of Western Ontario or Western University in Canada, Ontario, Canada. And it, I'm in the, um, on the Faculty of Information and Media Studies there. And my study, my degree will, you know, if everything goes right, it'll be in media studies. <laughs> Okay. And, um, yeah, so I've been working on actually writing the dissertation the last, like, uh, four years now. So it's, it's, uh, it's been going okay. I mean, I can only really work on it part-time because I have a lot of other things on my plate. But thankfully, uh, my advisor has been pretty cool, and he's been working with me. And, I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's been a beast, and I, I just want to get it over with now. Yeah. So, yeah. So hopefully next next time we meet you'll be you'll be in Dr. Netherton. Yeah? yeah, we'll see. Okay, so last question for tonight. Uh, the show is called "What's Metal." So what what do you think is metal? Um, yeah, what's a well? To, it, it is. It's it's a form of rock music, sort of rock rock and roll. And you know, if you if you trace it back, you know, metal to me became you know, a, a, a genre of musical expression within that, within that world of rock and, you know, as it, on its course of, of becoming more defined and, and refined, it, it, uh, it, uh, it kind of, you know, became its own genre. People knew as well, the genre of heavy metal is something which was uh, separate from rock at that point and although a part of it, you know, and, and all the other subgenres that came out of that. As far as the music of metal, that to me is metal, is, is metal music. And <clears throat> of course there's a culture and a lifestyle, I guess, or that has kind of arisen around the music itself, you know, and grown along with the music and become this kind of like integrated thing. You know, it's a business as well. There's a lot of money in, in kind of these big European festivals, you know, that cater to metal. So there's that commercial aspect to it, I guess. And, um, you know, for a lot, but for a lot of people, metal is just something, I think it's just a, it's a person, for me, it's a personal relationship. You know, my relationship with metal has helped, helped me through a lot of things. You know, it's, being able to express myself through metal, you know, identifying with metal, friends who are in metal, like, it's all kind of this <laughs> constellation of different things, if you will, you know, that, so I guess it is, if the answer, the one answer is just not one thing, metal is this, uh, it's a constellation of experiences, musical, social, you know, and it all comes together in that, <laughs> that one sort of world. <laughs> Right. I guess it's it's a whole it's a roundabout way of saying that it's, I guess I can't I don't really have a specific answer. <laughs> well, these are these are good closing comments. Thanks a lot. <laughs>